Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, uh, this afternoon into evening, depending on your time zone. Um, we're really excited to have you here um, for an awesome skill session. But first, I'm just going to run through a couple quick announcements. As always, if you have any questions, shoot an email to tea at nd.edu. Um, we'll be happy to answer those for you. Another reminder, this Saturday, July 11th at 4 p.m., we'll be having another networking night. This one will include industry professionals. Um, so it's a really good chance to meet other students and to ask questions to, you know, professionals from all over the industry, um, from all sorts of different fields, whether that's technical, creative, and everything in between. So definitely come on out, invite your friends, invite any professionals uh, you know might be interested, and uh, you'll have a good time there. You'll be at the same Zoom link that you're on tonight, so just use, you know, same link. And with that, we'll go ahead and jump into our session for today. So we'll be hearing on design competitions from Tiffany. Uh, she is currently working for Disney, recently graduated from the Ohio State University, um, but also is helping run their OSU TPEG alumni um, competition that some of you may be interested in this summer. So she's gonna have a really uh, cool perspective to share with us having both competed in some competitions, but also uh, sort of setting up and running their own. So with that, I'll pass it off to you, Tiffany. Um, cool, thanks and hi everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm just gonna share kind of the top seven questions about design competitions, and then we'll jump into a and A. So any questions you guys have about design competitions or life or whatever, feel free to ask. We'll open it up at the end. It should be pretty short for the presentation part. Let me just share my screen and we'll do all the fun stuff. All right, so top seven questions for design competitions. And then I can see everybody. Show of hands, who all, raise your hand if you've done a competition, a design competition. Okay, so we've got a pretty good mix, that's awesome. Um, so these are, geared a little bit towards beginners, but everybody can learn something from these. So first question, why should you enter? It is a wonderful resource to have in your portfolio. It's a great way if you're in a job interview to pull it out and just show people those skills that maybe in a job as an intern you wouldn't necessarily get to work on because it is a little bit more advanced work. It's a great way to show people a project from start to finish and it's something you're passionate about and maybe you also would not get this experience in any of your typical classes. Um, it is a wonderful way to learn new skills. I know I've learned a lot of new things. Um, some of the other uh, hosts of the TPEG OSU design competition, they also helped write this. So one of them had never experienced Photoshop before. I never learned SketchUp until I did design competitions. So it's just a really way to expand those skills. And then it's also industry experience outside of an internship. So especially if you're a sophomore or a freshman and you really haven't had a lot of industry internships yet, this is a really great way to beef up your portfolio. Um, all design competitions are going to have really unique prompts. I've had some that are 24 hour competitions. I've had some where they gave you a budget and you had to analyze every little thing. All of them are a little different, but that's what makes it fun because every single time you're going to get in there and you're going to find new ways to challenge yourself. You are going to be expected to give deliverable and it is a time commitment. I would say don't let the time commitment freak you out too much. Just be aware that you're going to have a deadline, but don't let that deter you from doing it. And then it's also to have fun. You're gonna meet a lot of new people and you're gonna to get to make something really cool at the end of it that you're gonna be hopefully very proud of. Should you work on a team? Absolutely, working on teams is a great way to learn from other people. I would say, especially when you're making your team, try to find people who have different majors than you. I personally am not an engineering major, but I've met a lot of engineering students through doing all these design competitions. Um, you know, try to get people who are different majors. So if you have a mechanical engineer, try to also get an electrical engineer, try to get someone from business, get your roommate involved who's in art, you know, try to meet as many people as possible because that's just gonna grow your skill set, and everybody around you is gonna learn something new. And it also prepares you for an office environment because rarely after you leave college will you ever be working on a project by yourself. Uh, there's no one set software to use. It's not an end all be all. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, so, you know, use those skills that maybe you wouldn't otherwise get to show, but it's also a really low stakes opportunity to learn a new software and then 
just go for it and see what you're capable of. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, if it, it's a competition, but it's not a high stakes. If you don't get first place, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but it's a really great way to test those boundaries and see what softwares you can use. Um, I've learned how to use SketchUp, Mandy, and Stephanie, who also helped make this PowerPoint. They couldn't be here tonight, but they've used Photoshop and SolidWorks. And then how, you know, with the time limit, what are some good steps on how to make an attainable timeline? Uh, make time each week, you know, set a few hours aside. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but set that into your schedule so you know this is the time I'm going to dedicate it and it'll make it much more manageable for you. A big thing is to set up due dates with team members. Uh, we've all been on group projects. We all know how it gets when it gets down to that 11.59. I see some people nodding. Yes, when it's 11.59 and you're like, ah, you got to turn it in. So set up due dates with your team members ahead of time. Maybe make it due a few days ahead just in case there are bumps in the road. And then also don't let fear of not being first place to cheer you from this. Put whatever time you can into it and what you put into it is what you get out of it. It's a really great way just to have that experience without a time commitment that an internship or something like that with school would entail. And then here's a list of some competitions that are available. I think Jacob, you're gonna be able to send this PDF out to everybody, right? Yep. Okay, That's cool. Great. I can't I'll see you. I only see like yeah, four sorry. faces. <laughs> I'll send it out in the email and in the Discord channel as well. Awesome, yeah. They're becoming really, really popular. So just always be on LinkedIn, try to join different groups uh, just to see what people are posting. But it's some popular ones, Disney Imaginations, the Ryerson Invitational. Honestly, I do not know too much about that one, but I know you have to be invited and it's during IAPA. Cornell puts on one every spring, I believe. And then TEA has a bunch of next gen events. I know there was a haunted house competition this summer. And then of course the one I'm doing. So if you're doing mine, ooh, that'll be fun. Um, yeah, so that is all that I officially have, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask away. I guess I'll start with one question I have. So when it comes to, you know, preparing for one of these things, how much care, I guess, like ahead of time should you do like preparing for the competition? So say like, you know, you're going to do Disney Imaginations in mm -hmm fall when should you start like thinking about getting your team together and like how much you know like should you be preparing before imaginations like even starts in the fall or something you know kind of along those lines yeah imaginations is a big one i've done that one a couple times and both times because of how involved that one is we've started forming our teams about a month before just because that with the ones that are more consistent, I would say you could probably start planning a month before trying to get people together just to see if they're even thinking about it. And then maybe two weeks before really start to solidify your teams because the prompts won't be out until the competition starts anyway. So if you have your team before it gets released, it just makes your life so much easier than trying to reach out to people last second. Um, but, you know, that's what's great about these different groups on GroupMe and Facebook and LinkedIn is the fact that you have these people. So when these newer competitions pop up, you have people to reach out to and you just kind of have some friends in your back pocket that you know you can reach out to. So it's always good to know like of your friends who likes to do these kinds of competitions, you know, who to go to, who is just, that's not their cup of tea, that kind of thing. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Sure, I have a question. Um, did you, uh, when doing these design competitions, did you ever have any faculty advising on them or anybody outside advising, even though they weren't actually directly involved? No, no, we did not. I don't remember if the imaginations won, if you were allowed to. I think that one, if I remember, you're allowed to consult with other people, but you're not allowed to actually use their ideas. If that that sounds right. It's been about two years. So I know it's very rigid, the rules. Um, I never personally reached out to other people. Um, I don't see why in certain competitions, why it would be a problem if, you know, you, you have someone that you trust and like, is like a mentor to you. Yeah. I wish I had someone I could have shown my stuff, <laughs> but no, cool, I showed you. them to 
some of my leaders, because I did my last imaginations competition. So I graduated from college and then I was an intern at Disney. Um, and while I was an intern, I was doing imaginations. And some of my bosses, once the projects were turned in and completed, we were able to show it. Um, and they just thought it was pretty cool. So it's always fun to show people afterwards, because I know there are some rules about showing it early and all of that. But yeah, if you have a mentor, go for it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Jessica, oh, you have a fancy hand. That's very cool. It's a clapping emoji, but I figured it worked. Um, so you mentioned you did the imaginations competition twice mm -hmm. or multiple times. Mm -hmm. Were there any differences that you found when you repeated a competition after the first time? I worked on different, I worked with different people. So that was definitely different. Our skill set. The one I did 2018, we had a student on our team who was studying architecture. So we ended up with some just really beautiful designs since, you know, that was her forte. Um, and then the next year we used a lot of SketchUp and just the way we presented our ideas was a little different. So, you know, just making sure you've got a team with a lot of variety of people and skill set that'll definitely help you out because that year, oh, it looks so pretty. <laughs> so it was a good time. Yeah, it also I, I can put in my two cents because I've also I've done one imaginations and I tried to do a second one, um, but it didn't end up working out just because uh, the team wasn't able to be formed because everybody's schedules were so varied. So I think that's also, I guess, to Jacob's point, like when you start looking for your team, just I think kind of make sure you have in the back of your mind some some other people that you might want to bring in because with imaginations, it was it's like two to four people. Um, so if it turns out that some people's semester schedules just become really booked, like as they're figuring out their classes, then you might want to just have some other people like as a, a backup in mind. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Schedules are crazy, especially in college when you have classes every hour of the day. So looking ahead and being realistic too, you know, if you have a class every day in the afternoon, are you really going to be able to you know, rush and turn in a project? Probably not. So meeting with people whose schedules are similar is definitely a good point. And then I see someone had a comment. They said the rules have changed a lot every year. Oh, yeah. So always read your rules because every year they might be a little different. So always just follow the rules and read them because, yeah. All right, go for it to her. I see if your hand raised. <laughs> so I have a question about when you are forming teams and you think everything is fine but you get down the line and you run into team member conflicts just in terms of not wanting to contribute anymore or just deciding they don't want to or their idea about what they want to do has changed. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that with eligibility rules of okay you have to have x many teammates and if one drops out your whole team is disqualified um if you have any tips on how to handle that that would be great so there was one time i did the 24-hour competition and there were four of us total and then there was one guy and he just decided around i think we started around like 6 p.m and around 8 p.m he was kind of invested around 9 p.m. He was like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And so we left and we said, okay, well, this is what we have to do. And so we finished it. So I think just having those conversations with those people, if it really comes down to the wire, like you were saying, where you could be disqualified, I would say reach out to the people hosting the event, explain the situation. Because I don't know, I would hope that they would give you the benefit of the doubt and still let you complete your project just without this person's name attached to it. Um, Cause they, they would understand. Cause if anything, I would think that they would be more interested in having less people complete more work than if you were trying to add people in last minute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think it just comes down to, you know, if this person doesn't want to work, you have to have that on, honest conversation with them and say, okay, well, if you don't want to do this, we're going to have to take your name off it. You're not going to be able to use this in your portfolio and things like that. And hopefully, you know, if they are invested in the industry and invested in gaining this experience, they won't do that. Um, but I think it also comes down to time management and figuring out how much they are able to do it. So say someone really wants to be in this competition, but their class this semester, you know, they are 
their GPA is failing and they really want to be involved in everything, maybe just shift around roles. So willing to be that team member, willing to shift around, okay, maybe you just do X, Y, Z, and then I'll do this part. Um, so just having your teams back and just being really open and honest, I think that's the most important thing. Just have open lines of communication with everybody. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I love your background. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Mary, I see you have your hand raised. Go for it. Oh, you, oh my God. All you guys have a cool background. Yep. Um, so my question is um, basically when you are, see, I know that the rules for all these different competitions and what they expect you to deliver are different, but, you know, say taking imaginations as an example, when you're creating a design for a competition, um, basically how much depth should you be going into? Because I know sometimes, you know, it's easy to go into kind of, the, you know, down this rabbit hole of just planning and coming up with more ideas and more details for your project. But like, <laughs> where do you stop? <laughs> That's a good, I can show you guys um, one of the ones that I did. Legal disclaimer, I don't own anything. Imaginations owns it all. Uh, let's see. So this was the one we did in 2018. Legal disclaimer. Um, so what we did was they were trying to figure out how do you take and oh wait, I'm not sharing my screen. Oh dear. Here we go. So what we were trying to do was take, I'll show the disclaimer again for the recording. Da, da, da. Um, you had to take an abandoned area and turn it into something new. So I would say when you're making something, so for example, this one, the image kind of speaks for itself as in describing it. So when we wrote out our little blurb, it was much more about just a quick snippet of where this place is, why people are gonna visit, just a snapshot. So think of it kind of as if you were making a vacation brochure and if someone was gonna come stay here, what would they need to know? You know, they're not gonna need to know, oh, we imported X, Y, Z from this land and we've got, these, you know, just whittle it down. And it's hard. It's so hard when you come up with all these really crazy cool ideas. Um, but it's just kind of letting the images, if you're going to be really image heavy, speak for themselves, and then just connecting the dots and allowing people to understand. So it doesn't need to be the most in the world. You know, these are really little paragraphs with your images. Um, so just be aware that, you know, it does, you don't have to write a book but then at the same time, you don't want to undersell it. I think it also doesn't hurt to, when you're making it, just write out everything in the world and then start to pare it down. Because when you write everything out, you're able to conceptualize it better. You're able to fully realize this place that you're making, but then that's not necessarily going to be in the final product. If that helps. Thanks very much. I really like the advice about making it like what you would want people to see if they're reading a resort brochure. Mm -hmm. That's good. So a question that I'll ask kind of a little bit shifts from design competitions, but would you mind sharing, you know, the sort of like your path into Wind Entertainment and like what led you to where you are now? Sure, sure. Um, so I started in the themed entertainment. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, went to Ohio State. I started in the themed entertainment industry in about 2015 officially. Um, I worked at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium out in Dublin, Ohio. If you guys are ever there, you should check it out. It's really cool. Um, and just really fell in love with the whole tourism industry and the hospitality and figuring out, you know, people aren't just coming here because they need to get something on their shopping list or it's on their to-do list. They're coming here purely to go have fun and enjoy the day off with their family. And then from there, when I went back to Ohio State, my sister's in engineering, so she found the TPEG group that was at Ohio State. And then I was able to get involved with that group as well, learn more about design competitions, learned about the Disney College program, um, and met a lot of other people in the industry. There was me and one other girl in the club, we were the only two non-engineering people, so we hung out a lot. Um, and she helped me get a role at Coaster Nation, so I wrote some blog posts and, and worked a little bit on their Facebook page, making all those posts and telling people about theme parks all around the world. I wrote a lot of articles for SeaWorld and all about the marine animals that they were helping. I did the Disney College program. I worked, oh wait, before that, I worked at Cedar Point in guest services. And what was really unique about that was we got to be involved with almost every aspect of the parks, you know, learning how as a whole, how all the different departments connect and how everybody works together. 
and then we would go out and help with their special events. So the red, white, and blue, the boom, and summer nights. We were there when they were testing uh, virtual reality on Iron Dragon, so that was pretty cool. We got to go out and pick people, and they got to be these super special people that got to ride the roller coaster with these VR headsets on. And then I did the Disney College program. I worked in the Magic Kingdom, which Allie has in her lovely background. And yeah, that was really amazing. That was my first opportunity to get into the Walt Disney Company. When I was there, I did the entertainment class, did a lot of meet and greets, went back to school, graduated. I was going to do a second college program two weeks before I was going to move down to Florida. It was the day after I graduated college. I got a call that I got a PI. So luckily I had an apartment and then I came down, did the PI. I'm in the uh, same department that I was in then. So the department I'm in is business operations. And what that is, is we work with all the cast members when they go to the park as a guest. So if any of you have ever worked there, you get special tickets when you're a cast member. So we work with all of those benefits. We also work with the clients. So if you ever went there with school, with marching band, you had a large ticket order. We also help fill those out and return anything once the events are over. And then we also work a lot with My Disney Experience. So if cast members are having a problem because their tickets are so unique, we go in and we fix that, clean that all up. And then in March, last March, I was hired on full-time to our team. And then I've been there ever since. Woo, that's it. Awesome. Thank you. I just saw you hadn't added that in your uh, PowerPoint. So I was interested to sort of hear how that went for you. That a lot yeah. of really cool Lauren, you're across high. the board. That's cool. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions about open it, hit page. Graduate. You want to read it out loud? I can also talk and explain it. Yeah. So yeah, I just didn't it. know if there was a line. Um, right, go for it, Paige. So my name's Paige Ryder. Um, I originally graduated with my bachelor's in 2016 and didn't have luck getting into the theme entertainment industry the first time around, so. Mm -hmm. Been in the auto industry for the past four years, back at school, getting my master's awesome. um, full time. But I've gotten mixed um, feelings about me participating in these competitions um, mm -hmm. from a, I don't know, um, experience standpoint. So like, for example, I wasn't able to do the TPEG alumni competition, totally fine by the way, um, but I did do the Cornell competition. So I was curious if you had any thoughts for like a, a graduate student or somebody with more industry experience that still wants to get this type of experience. And that's tough because I think the design competitions are very much geared toward undergraduate students. Um, mm -hmm. But I think once you're out of undergrad, you're going to have so many, you know, projects under your belt professionally, and those are going to speak to similar experiences that a design competition would. So I kind of equate design competitions with internship experience, whereas you, you know, you're out there, you're doing professional work already, you've got these grad project projects, um, and all these other things that you've done in your professional life. And so I think I think you're going to be okay. You know, if you already have a lot of this experience, I think for you, someone who's a grad student and already working professionally, the most important thing would be networking and talking to those people and showing them, hey, you know, I am a professional. I am qualified. Look at all the things that I've done. And I think that route would be more suited for someone who has um, already has the professional experience down. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, at least for me, um, sorry, I just wanted to, um, as a grad student myself, I'm still going to um, enter into a design competition. It's more museum related, but just saying that there are uh, competitions out there that can still be geared towards non-undergraduate students. Um, yeah, and if you have them, go ahead and share them. I just personally haven't seen as many of them. Um, but yeah, if you've got them, if you, you and Paige want to get together and share them. There's yeah, also, again, this one is more museum design or museum specific about like climate action, but oh. um, it still seemed within the, I'm kind of dabbling in both themed entertainment and museums. So yeah, that's uh, a, if you want to share it in the comments so people can be aware of those, that would be. I have the same one. It's called Reimagining Museum for Climate Action. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Glasgow Science Center. So I'll type it. Yep, there it is. Awesome. Pretty cool looking yeah. and it's open for anybody yeah and see that's the benefit of things like this you know there's so many competitions out there that 
one person, we don't know them all. So it's great to talk with other people and hear about all the different things that are going on. So thank you, Lauren. I'll add one minor suggestion to that too. Um, I know like maybe some competitions will say, you know, you need to be an undergrad, but it's also worth, you know, still putting a team together and like tackling the prompt. Um, and like, you could probably still reach out to the judges or whatever and say, hey, would you be willing to give us feedback on this? Like, we're not submitting it as like a competitive project, but you can still then use that to like boost your own portfolio, which is kind of one of the greatest benefits that come from these competitions. Um, so it may still be worth it to like tackle the prompt. Um, yeah. And that's a good idea too, just for regular students, you know, just challenging your skills. Imaginations, they've got a bunch of their old prompts online, or you could just make one up yourself. Um, but I'll, there's a lot of prompts that are already online that competitions have concluded or there a few years ago. So that's a great idea. Um, could I ask one question? Yeah, go for it. How, did you and how did you deal with imposter? Did you ever have to deal with imposter syndrome while you were working on the competitions? And how did you work past? Like I think what's so fun about the competitions is there it's it's less at least for me it's a lot less pressure than you know an actual assignment that I have to turn in or something you need to do for work because it's all about your own creativity so for me I see it more as just a game and a challenge and just kind of figuring out what can I do what can I do uh, but you know sometimes you do get intimidated by your other friends on the projects and sometimes they're really good at xyz but I would say don't let that stop you from you know ex exploring all these different ideas and it's also a really great time to learn you know if you are if you feel confident enough to work with these people on this project and you know usually if they're on a team with you obviously you guys are friends or you get along well together ask them to sit down with you and show you the different softwares that you're using just yeah really lean into them because honestly sometimes the best way to learn experience is from people at your own level or a little bit above you when they'll actually sit down and show you okay this is the software this is how we do this um i noticed a couple times in tpeg when i was there i attended like solidworks workshops our tpeg leader she would lead us through and i had no idea what they were talking about because i'm not a mechanical engineer but i just thought it was i think we made what did we make we made the ride vehicle for winnie the pooh I didn't know what I was doing, but it was a great time. We learned a new skill. It's awesome. So I would just say, you know, bring that back to your TPEG leaders or whatever it is that you call them at your school. See if they can have different workshops throughout the semester. And yeah, so just, I would say, keep, think of it as a, a learning opportunity and just have fun with it. Thank you. I have another question. Yeah. Um, with the many design competitions that you've worked on have you ever found that maybe for a particular project with the team that you had you were missing a skill but then you were able to I guess not really backfill but you were able to compensate for that in other aspects mm. we definitely had to do that excuse me and the last imaginations one I did because the year before as you saw beautiful pictures. She was an architect. She was an artist. It was wonderful. The next year, we really had to ste step up our SketchUp game. And a couple times, even when we were designing it, we were like, oh my gosh, if only she was here and she could make this all glossy and gorgeous. So, but at the same time, you know, it pushed us to be more creative and be more inventive in how we did things and really pushed the limits on what we knew. Yeah, it's definitely challenging when you have that one person that's very artistic and can make it all look mm -hmm. nice and shiny goes away. And then, sorry, second, somewhat unrelated question. Yeah. Um, how did you end up marketing those? Like, because you mentioned that when you're going into like a job or interview, it's something that you can talk about. So did you include it in like a portfolio? Did you, like, how did you talk about your design competition experience? Yes, that's awesome. So a lot of times what I do and what I still do to this day in meet and greets is I will bring just a really thin binder and I'll put in it the different projects that I've worked on. So I've worked on like newsletters and some metrics and just little things like that or this project that I've worked on. So then when I go to these meet and greets, Personally, I'm someone where if I don't have something to talk about, I'll just forget everything that I've done. So I need like a visual example. And also a lot of times, people are also visual like that. So what I'll do is I'll just sit it down in front of them. I say, hello, nice to meet you. This is a little bit about me. And then I'm going to ask you about you because what I've learned about meet and greets is it's a lot about them wanting to meet you as much as it is 
you wanting to meet them. So obviously don't spend the whole time talking about these things, um, but you know, five, 10 minutes, talk about you, talk about what you wanna learn, where you wanna go, where you wanna grow, that's really great. And then in interviews, if someone asks you a question, for example, about conflict or learning new skills, you can bring up your project and say, well, originally this person was involved, then we did this, then we did that. And it can show a lot of things, it can show teamwork, you're gonna tell a story, it's gonna have beginning, middle, end, and you have this wonderful presentation and project that you can literally hand someone and say, well, here you go, I need this. And that's just very, it's very impressive. Cool. So I'll ask a question as well. When it comes to these competitions, so as a mechanical engineer, right, I'm big into <clears> the technical <throat> side of things. I found one of the challenges is, you know, you design this really cool system and then you know, so much falls on the communication at the end of the project, like in your submission, you have your seven slides or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for, you know, how to take this great idea or something you've created and like communicate it effectively so that, you know, you don't lose bits and pieces of that in the process of the judging? Mm -hmm. From what I have observed, from what my mechanical engineer friends have done, is they kind of have made um, blueprints laying it all out. So make it so visual and so intuitive that if you do have to supplement it with any written text, it's just like a few sentences. So, you know, make your layout for the ride, make the ride vehicle. You know, if these people are experienced in the industry in which you are presenting something, they're gonna know what it is you're talking about. So you don't have to say, oh, I looked at X, Y website. This is the design I found, da, 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 da. They know all that. So just assume that these people they know they know what they're talking about that's why they're hosting these things so you can you can cut out a lot of the fluff and you can just get right to the meat of this is my idea and this is why it makes sense yeah I think also for mechanical engineering um, I think they also like to see like if you've done like simple calculations so for instance if you want to show I don't know something with water and like flow if you want to say like oh this outputs this many gallons and just showing kind of like really simple base work of how you got to there. That means that it kind of shows them, oh, wow, they really thought through this entire process and they have the background knowledge to support that. So like if you have like a diagram and then you just put like, I don't know, like two equations next to it to just kind of back up your findings, then that can help too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But less is more, I would say. Yeah. Just try to think of how can I show this without saying anything? But yes, thank you, Daniel. Thank you both. That's awesome. Any other questions from the crowd? Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I hope some of this. Oh, Cameron, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just a quick okay. question. Um, yeah. So for imaginations, about how much time a week does it take? Because it's something I'm interested in, but I'm also pretty busy. Um, it depends how you want your project, how invested and how in depth you want your final project to be. Um, it just depends. I would say at minimum, it should be three hours a week. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And you can split that up between different days. You can know, a half hour here, half hour there, but definitely, you know, have check-ins with your team every few weeks as well. Do you think there'll be any major changes with the competitions this year, just like in your opinion? You know, I'm not sure because already a lot of the design competitions are online. So I think they've already got a system and I think the way people collaborate. So maybe you guys, that might be a little different. I think there'll be more Zoom calls rather than in-person collaboration. But otherwise, I don't see, I think it'll be really interesting to see who is now able to be on a team just because now we are so invested in video chats, maybe people who would have never been in the industry or maybe people on either coast, they're now gonna be able to be on a team. I think the collaboration is gonna, gonna increase as we move forward. Yeah, at least one thing I'm noticing with a couple competitions I'm looking at, and I don't know if this will be consistently across the board, but a lot is about like COVID-19 response and how uh, these places are moving, or these institutions are moving forward. So mm -hmm. at least in general, um, even if it's not a major point, it seems like a lot are about like what reopening or uh, mm -hmm. what kind of new places will look like in that respect. 
Um, not necessarily that's for every competition, but at least that's what I'm seeing in the few I'm looking at so far. Yeah. Any other questions? Go for it. So you mentioned, Tiffany, when you were um, networking and at meet and greets, you would bring a binder. Mm -hmm. Do you know if um, professionals or anybody has a preference to seeing like physical printed work or if they're okay if you bring an iPad with your um, sketches and your resume? Is there yeah. any preference there? No, uh, I think it, it'll definitely set you apart if you can physically bring something and share with them what you're doing. Um, yeah, if you have an iPad, if you want to be green, that's awesome too. I think, you know, anytime you, I, I was once told a very long time ago that the most valuable thing someone can give you is their time. So if someone is willing to sit down with you, even if it's for 15 minutes, make the most of those 15 minutes. Um, meet and greets are many interviews and you never know where those connections and networking in that way can lead. So if you have a chance to show what you've got, go for it. Thank you. You're welcome. You build robots. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's actually what my master's is, is robotics. Well, you know what? If someone pulled out a BB-8 and just was like, oh, look, I built, I would be impressed. So, I mean, you know, whatever is easy for you, if it's heavy, maybe don't bring it. But you know what? If you've, if you've got the space and you want to show it to someone, I say go for it. But that's just me. I was trying to get creative for the upcoming IATA since things yeah. are so tight. I was like, I have to do something to set myself apart. I what wonder the robots. What if you even took um, just because I don't know how big these robots are, or if they are kind of hard to carry around. If you like uh, Chara was saying, if you make, took videos of the robots doing different things, and then you mm -hmm. had that on the iPad, and then you could flip through them. That's probably a much more practical idea. <laughs> I just don't want you to. Oh my gosh! Well, I would hate to be carrying it, and then you know you trip, and then I trip a lot, so I would just go to that scenario. <laughs> yeah, I probably couldn't bring my 250 pound battle bot, but I might be able to bring something smaller. <laughs> oh, but yeah, but that's very, very cool. I mean, if you can showcase that or find some clever way to showcase it, that's that's awesome. We had a friend who brought his robot to IAPA this year, and on like the first day, it ended up breaking down, and he had to carry it in his bag the whole time. No. Okay, good to know. Oh, no, I was just kidding. Don't show BB-8. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. <laughs> MK Haley. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions still remaining out there? Yes, right. but uh, Haley does bring up a good point. You know, if you are producing different things, make sure that, you know, it is work that you've completed um, and things of that nature. So, you know, if you're doing an internship where things are classified, you know, don't print that out. Don't bring that around. Make sure you have, uh, you check with your leadership and figure out um, what it is that you're able to share with other people. And it's also just a good check-in, but that's what's really great about all of these design competitions. Um, is usually they'll either tell you, you know, put a disclaimer in it or you can, or this is fair use. So yeah, it's all good stuff. But I was just kidding about BBA. <laughs> all right, well, if there are no other questions, uh, feel free to head on out. Um, and then uh, we'll be having our next session this Thursday at the same time, and it'll be focusing on uh, how to make a pitch or an idea. Um, so look forward to that and I, uh, I hope I'll see you guys there. Thanks again, Tiffany, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and end the video.